Thank you to the worship team this morning for leading us so beautifully. I remember once I asked a lady, now what do you do in the church? She said, well, I persecute the church. I said, what do you mean? She said, I'm in the worship team. <laughs> I don't think that applies here. But uh, two weeks ago, I mentioned about some Christian brothers who were sentenced to death in Pakistan uh, for their faith and have been hoping to hear any news of what's happened to them and we thank you for their prayers but we have, haven't heard anything but I did hear about a Christian lady who was also on death row in Pakistan who was released the other day and we thank God for that and obviously the prayers of God's people. And also thank you to those who prayed for our ministry. As many of you know, we are engaged in a, in a program of evangelism, different parts of our country and other parts of the world as we seek to obey the Great Commission and go out and serve God, particularly in the parts of the world where people have never heard of the name Jesus and what a challenge that is. Now this morning I want us to turn to the Word of God, to the book of Samuel, first Samuel, in the Old Testament. First Samuel in the Old Testament, and we're going to read from uh, chapter, uh, chapter 17, and uh, from verse 34, I think we're all familiar with the story. In 1 Samuel, chapter 17, it's the account of the encounter between David and Goliath. Now, we won't read the entire chapter, but we will be referring to different verses as we go along. And so I want us to look, just for the sake of our uh, certain verses here, from verse 34 onwards. 1 Samuel, chapter 17, verse 34. And, uh, and David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. When it arose against me, I caught it by the beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion, from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed David and his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and said, and try to walk, for he had not tested them. David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. May God bless and anoint those words into our hearts today. Shall we bow for just a brief moment of prayer? Our God and our Father, we thank you for another opportunity to gather with the body of Christ in this corner of your vineyard. We thank you for that which draws us together. And our hearts are here to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you for the sense of your presence amongst us already. And we pray that that which we have sought to render will be acceptable in your sight. We come to pray for your blessing upon each one that has gathered. You don't know the needs of each life, for just as our faces differ, so do our needs. But you th we thank you that in spite of all of our needs, great or small, your love is still the same. 
and you love and care for us. Even the very hairs of our head are all numbered. You neither slumber nor sleep. You long for us to sense your presence and to trust you. We commit, Lord, our dear country at this time. You'll know the areas of desperate need, the forces of darkness that seem to be loose. We pray that God would be merciful. We rejoice over those who receive their matriculation certificates this week. And we pray for your blessing and guidance for each one. We commit to you those who travel today on their way home from holiday. We ask for your protection from danger and harm and evil. And may families find their way home safely. Now, Lord, your word goes forth today across our nation. May it go forth in power. May many who sit in darkness and beneath the shadow of death see a great light and respond in faith and discover the reality of Jesus Christ and his presence. Grant now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts shall be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen and amen. As I said a moment ago, I think we're all familiar uh, with the story of David and Goliath. I think even from teenage days, from childhood days, the story has always been a favorite uh, amongst so many. As young David found himself confronting the great giant Goliath, at a moment in the history of the nation when everything seemed impossible. The king was in a backslidden condition. He dared not step out into the arena. He knew he would never be able to cope with what was coming. And he was facing the future with little hope. But then God stepped in on the horizon, raised the most unpredictable, the most unlikely to challenge the giant of the day. And as I was thinking over this wonderful story, friends, and looked into the many challenges of the new year, I think that there are many giants on the horizon, giants that threaten us. Giants in some cases terrify us. Giants that are there that we can't run from. Some giants are tangible. Others are intangible. Some giants are unattainable goals, unfinished projects, unfulfilled dreams, and even irrevocable situations. The giant has one goal, and that is to destroy your faith, to stop our progress as we walk and journey in the Christian life. And they threaten us from every quarter, internal as well as external conflicts, physical and emotional, unjust situations of which we've become victimized. You see, friends, we can't escape these giants that face us. But there is a way through. And that's the message of this book uh, this morning. Giant killers see an opportunity in the opposition. See potential in the problems. Victory in the shadow of defeat. David comes with a weapon that no one seemed to know anything about, as we see in the story. Satan's greatest weapon, friends, is to paralyze our faith, to keep us from using those spiritual weapons that are at our disposal through Christ. What a challenge it is. And I want to speak this morning for a while on 
David's game plan for Goliath. He didn't just walk into that situation blindly. The stakes were too high. The issues were too great. And so we find that he forms a game plan for his attack. But before he could even form that game plan, something had to take place within his heart, as it always needs to do. He had come to the situation, friends, when before even the strategy, a commitment had to be made in his heart. He had to pass a point of no return. He had to come to the place, friends, where he would have to publicly declare his intention from which there would be no going back. Otherwise, even the strategy, even the game plan would be doomed to fail. And he stands before his family. He stands before the crowd. He stands before the very nation. And he's alone. There would be no going back now. He was facing the battle of his life. Life and death were at stake. The future of the nation was now reduced to the individual level, as it always is. The Bible says the righteousness exalteth a nation. When we violate that rule, friends, we plunge into darkness and defeat. The game plan was getting to grips with his faith. You see, friends, your faith is the greatest asset you'll ever hold or have. Far more important than our intellectual status or other kinds of credentials of what we own. Your faith is your greatest weapon. The Bible says when Christ returns, will he find faith? So we find faith is unpacked in this incredible story. The game plan. The first thing I want to point out to you as we look at this game plan is what I call David used the reminders of the past. The reminders of God's faithfulness in the past. This is where it started from. You see, friends, when he faced the challenge, he faced it from God's perspective, not from Saul's, not from what was at stake, not from the size of Goliath, but from a divine perspective. And that's where we start. We have to view life. We have to view the situations from a divine perspective. Otherwise, we are attention. We deviated. David here starts by reminding himself of God's faithfulness in the past. Before he could face the challenge of the future, he had to remind himself that the same God of the past would be the same God for the future. You see, friends, there are certain things in life that we need to remember but forget. There are other things in life, friends, that we should forget, but we do remember. This is what happened here with David. He was remembering and reminding himself that God has not deviated. He has not abdicated. He's still on the throne. What a difference it makes as he approaches this impossible situation. The greatest single indicator of the future is God's performance in previous victories. Look for a moment at God's faithfulness. First of all, uh, historically, what God did in the past. The incredible conception and birth of Jesus right through to the resurrection. Somebody has put it this way that the life of Jesus was flanked by two impossibilities. The virgin birth and the resurrection. 
two total impossibilities. But here was Jesus at his best, fighting the word impossible. In fact, when Jesus rose from the dead, the word impossible was banished from his vocabulary. Historically, yes. Personally, Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 tells us that being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God is not finished with you. In fact, he's just begun. And today is a new day, the first day of the rest of your life. <clears throat> the next thing I want you to notice about the story was not only the reminders of the past, but also the realization of what the stakes were all about. The realization of what the stakes were all about. <clears throat> yes, the battle seemed impossible. King Saul had no idea what to do, the political leader of the day. But David had a way. He sees it again from God's perspective. Look at verse 25 as a, uh, to, compared to some of the other verses here and verse 26. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. This was a mistaken understanding of the battle. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. And David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? They had seen it from their own perspective. They had seen it, friends, from what their situation would end up in. But David comes and says, who has defied not just you and me, but the armies of the living God. He brings God into the equation. What a difference it makes. <clears throat> you see, friends, this is a battle that could not be won on the grounds of human strength and human strategy. There had to be a divine dimension. And there was, as there always is. Any issue that we're involved with, friends, has a source from which it comes. The opposite of faith is fear. Fear tolerated is faith contaminated. Fear tolerated becomes faith contaminated, which cannot function. The issues at stake was the very glory of God and his intentions for his people. He had a plan for Israel as he has for you and me. The future of the nation was at stake. Somebody had to fight, be prepared to fight and win the battle. It was part of the battle of the ages. The whole Bible is filled from Genesis right through to Revelation with battles and fights right through to the blood-stained fields of Armageddon. One long fight and you and I find ourselves caught in the conflict and either we sway the side or we sway that side. The battle of the ages. Goliath brought an added dimension into the battle. We read here these interesting words in verse 43. The dimension that he introduced into the battle that was not obvious in the beginning. He cursed David by his gods. 
He brought evil influences, evil gods, evil powers into the battlefield now. The powers of the occult sprang into action. And unless David was clothed with the home armor of God, he didn't have a chance. We're living in a day, friends, when we are seeing a revival of the occult like never before. Everything seems to be going back to this one evil force. From Harry Potter to the one side, uh, to the activity of the occult right into the heart of our own government. I read an article the other day by the religion of the new age. The classroom must and will become an arena of conflict between old and new. The rotting corpse of Christianity is the new faith of humanism, say these people. This is the kind of attack that we're under. Christianity has become the most attacked religion in the world, the most hated religion in the world. Everything you and I believe in is under attack. Battle is on, friends. Everything is at stake how you and I fight it. You can't run and you can't hide. Then we see something else what David employed here. The rejection of negatives. There were plenty of negative prophets around. As they are today. Verses 28 to 30. From his family. They didn't approve of what this man was seeking to do. He did not have their blessing. In fact, if you look at verse 29 carefully, uh, it says here, uh, sorry, verse 29, where is it here? 29. And David said, what have I done now? In other words, this wasn't just an immediate uh, response from his family. This was an ongoing attack from his family. What have I done now? What else have I done wrong? Not only from his family, but from the people, verse 30. They turned on him as well. And here he is going upstream, as it were, against the voice of society, who had no faith, of course. When you've got no faith, this is how we'll respond. From the king, the highest power, position in the nation, felt he was a young fool. Verses 42 to 44, the rejection from the enemy who tried to tell the young man that he didn't have a ghost of a chance. I think we need to often remind ourselves of the fact that God does not call the qualified, but qualifies the called. How true. God does not necessarily call the so-called qualified by the world standards, but he equips and he qualifies the called. Can I remind you that we all have a call on our lives? Some to the mission field, some across the seas, others across the street. There is a divine call on each life by the God that created us. And it is not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The next is, David here relies on spiritual weapons. Goliath was relying upon his strength, his superiority, his physical power, and all the weapons he had at his disposal. He even had a man, a man defending him, just in case. You see, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to 5, Paul says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty to the pulling down of the strongholds of the enemy. Do you know anything about those weapons? Or do we find ourselves relying upon carnal weapons? Ephesians chapter 6 tells us and lists some of the great weapons that have been purchased for us to use 
And yet somehow we struggle with that. Whenever we're in a conflict, whenever we're in a situation, friends, where your Goliath is about to thrust his spear through you, either we use a carnal weapon or we use a spiritual weapon. That's our choice. David had discovered a weapon both of defense as well as attack. He wanted to be holy before he could be a hero. The next is the resources from which he drew authority. It certainly wasn't his, but he found an authority that he had cultivated down through the years. Not a sudden belief, but a constant belief. And the amazing thing about the story is that here is God, here is young David, The battle of the ages is raging and God comes to the defense of his servant. As he longs to do, if we'll just let him. But as long as we feel we can cope and manage it ourselves, don't need what he offers, we'll never succeed. What are we relying on to get through? Condal advice? Retaliation, new scientific methods, our own brilliance, or what are we relying upon? David had an interesting bit of armor there with him. It wasn't just the sling. He had five stones. Those five stones had been, were smooth stones. They had been washed They had been carved for that moment. But he took those stones which were going to become his powerful weapon and he placed them into his his, uh, little bag that he had. We read here. What a challenge. He had what you call a shepherd's bag which in the hour of crisis, whether it was the, the, the bear, the lion, or Goliath, which in the hour of crisis, he could put his hand into that bag, and it was not empty. Many of us, the bag is empty. And there's nothing to draw from. There's nothing to hold on to. You're facing a new year. The issues are greater than we can imagine. And there's always the unexpected phone call, the unexpected knock on the door. My friends, there are challenges. How can we approach this world and our bags are empty? Yeah, we find young David. He's into battle. Then you'll notice he ran towards the enemy. When everybody else was running away from the enemy, David runs toward the enemy. He could never have been depending upon his own strength. It was totally, it was impossible. While everybody was running, David was running towards the enemy to face the challenge. There could be no going back. When the Spanish ships arrived on the east coast of America, they are about to explore a new country. The Spanish explorer ordered his sailors off their ships and come to the land. And when they had all come to the land, he ordered that those ships be burnt. He was trying to tell these sailors there was no return. And there is no return. The battle is on. We've got to face what has to be faced. We can't hide. We can't pretend. What a challenge. 
Some of you may remember who was our first boxing champion of the world, the first man of South Africa that became the first boxing champion of the world. Anybody can remember his name? Hmm? That's right, Victor Wheel, bantamweight champion of South Africa, the first hero. He beat Manuel Ortez in the Madison Square Garden back in the 1950s in New York and came back a hero. One after another tried to challenge Victor Wheel for the crown, but he repulsed them all. But then there came a man from Australia by the name of Jimmy Carruthers. He took on Victor Wheel. We didn't have television in those days, but he watched the 32 millimeter movies of how Vic fought. He tried to pick up some kink in the armor, some point of weakness, and he picked up something. And he waited for the fight to take place in the Rand Stadium in Johannesburg. There came the moment when the referee, Wolf Lovey, called the two together to shake hands. And then Victor Wheel had a particular kind of habit that he would use following the shaking of hands. He was a Roman Catholic. And one of his plans were that when he went back to the corner with his back towards his opponent, he would genuflex and say his prayers. The gong had gone, and yes, Victor Wheel still saying his prayers. Carruthers saw his opportunity, and he rushed across the ring and knocked out Victor Wheel in the first minute of the first round. There's a time to pray, but there's a time to fight. <laughs> this is what happened here. What a challenge. He runs towards the enemy. Faith is measured by action. Then we come to the final thought. He was in a reciprocating position. This was 51, 52, and 54. Goliath had never been challenged at this level before. Goliath knew nothing of the kind of ability that this David had supernaturally. This was a different kind of encounter. And it was one he could not counter himself. David throws that st- releases that stone and down comes Goliath. Then he did something interesting. He ran to where Goliath was lying and he unsheathed that sword, Goliath's sword, and he cut off the head. Of Goliath. In other words, he used the enemy's own weapon to win the victory. The whole thing bounced back. You see, friends, when God is in control, it's amazing what he can do. He will heal your broken heart if you give him the fragments. If we're in total surrender to him, he will give it. David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. In the olden days when they had the Olympic Games, a prize would be given to the winner who came first, who won the race. But there was one special kind of race where there was a different kind of winner. Each runner had a lamp, a light, a torch. It was a flame. And the winner was the one who finished the race with his light still burning. That's what it means. The light must still, the lamp must still be burning. Has it gone out? Has it begun to flicker? Have you lost your way? And we're standing at the beginning of a new year. And our lamps aren't burning. There are giants waiting for you. As they are for me. Can we face them? 
You cannot face them on your own. We need to be able to face them through the weapon of faith. And the object of faith is what it's all about. The object of faith is not me. The object of faith, friends, is not my denominational uh, 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 label. My, the object of my faith is how big is my God? Will you allow him to master it? Would you be prepared as you start out this year with all that lies ahead to come to that point where David came right at the outset to burn the bridges behind him, to reach the point of no return and step into the future believing that your hand rests in the hand of God. Ruling out the impossibility. Ruling out what Satan has thrown at you. What the world thinks of you. And finding that in God there is salvation. There is one that sticketh closer than a brother. There is one that will never leave you. Neither forsake you. It's a call of your will, isn't it? It's a challenge you cannot ignore. And I certainly wouldn't face the unknown of 2019 without my hand in his. Perhaps this morning God has spoken to your heart. The giants are there, there's no doubt. The fears are, are there. The shepherd's bag is empty. Before you start there, start there with a connection between your heart and his. He's promised to guide you. I'm going to suggest we bow for just a moment in prayer. And I want you to think over what you have said, what, what has been said over your mind and your heart. And I would invite you this morning to rededicate your life to God. As you fit before you face what has to be faced. I know our eyes are upon the problems. Let's look away from that. Look at the God. Look at it from God's perspective. The essential thing is to be connected with him. And I would urge each one under the sound of my voice. Rededicate yourself. To him and allow God to take over the reins and allow him to lead you on. You can trust him. He's proved it in the past and he wants to prove it in the future. But he wants your heart. I'd like to pray for any this morning and I'm sure all of us need to come to that point of that fresh dedication as we stand before the world outside. Would you raise your hand and say, Brother, please pray for me. I want to face this year with a heart that's rededicated to Jesus. Will you do that? And then we'll pray together. Wherever you are, just raise that hand right across this congregation right here. There, yes, and there up in the balcony. Anyone else? Just raise that hand in an act of rededication to Christ. There, yes. God bless you here and here. We need him. We can't live without him. Surrender that heart. Anyone else? Wherever you are. Father, we pray for many hands that have responded to your voice. We come just as we are. We come, Lord, there's nothing that we can boast of. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. But we come, Lord, in response to your invitation, in response to the fact that you've declared and revealed yourself in your word as a God that wants to personally be acquainted with. 
you walk with us. Yea, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. We don't know what the future holds, but from today, we surrender the problems, we surrender the fears, we, we surrender what others are saying, believing that only God will have the final say in each one of our lives. Lay hold of each life that has responded. Ministering grace, we ask you, and build up a reservoir of faith to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.